Hey, welcome to the live stream. Glad to have you here. You're in the right place. If you're watching this on replay, you may want to fast forward about 11 minutes. and That's when we'll have our guest on here. Or if you're watching us live, please stick around and watch the countdown. Scott Walsh is going to be our special guest tonight. Just buying that software isn't what makes the difference. You've got to learn to use that tool, just like you've got to learn to use your high-end Powermatic woodworking tools or Fest tool for Sedge out there. So I think it's, you got to kind of leverage all of it. And I just realized this is a new camera. I didn't take off the protective plastic over it. So I don't know if that was blurry or not for you. Oops. (laughs) Hey, look at that. In your little intro which was very well put together uh, as i was sitting backstage and you, you had all these little clips from your previous guests um there <laughs> lot, there was lots of good information in there but, but somebody mentioned you know like uh just finding um that thing that you love and do the thing you love don't don't make things that you don't like making in terms of growing a business especially a business where you make things is make the things you want to sell um, uh, I want to say Brad Rodriguez said this many times uh, a while back, where it's like, if you don't want to sell cutting boards, stop making cutting boards. If you want to sell tables, make some tables and sell them at a loss if you have to, just to get some tables out there you sold. You now you like you attract clients that you can show you've actually made a thing. If you're trying to sell couches, don't keep making coasters, telling people you can make couches, make some couches. A lot of times, it, usually when people start out on YouTube or when they're building a YouTube channel, uh, they'll feel like they'll feel like their energies. If it's a scale of one to ten, uh, they'll feel like they're at like an eight or a nine, and they'll be like, "Whoa!" But then when they actually watch themselves on camera, it's actually more like a two or three. <laughs> we do take sponsors, you know, especially as a lot of the smaller channels. And there's two ways that they talk about sponsorship. Sponsorship is someone paying you to do something, and the other one is getting free tools and stuff. Launch day is my favorite day. That is my favorite day of, of the week. I just absolutely love launching videos and getting the getting the feedback. So yeah, that's most videos take four to five full days to make. And I would like to streamline that. I would like to put out more videos in a week. It's really kind of sad because I didn't get involved even when he was doing the noodle boards. He, he pretty much did all that. I did everything in the house so that he could stay in the shop a lot. I am a little conflicted, I think. Uh, it initially started off with just sharing um, like my sewing machines and sewing tips and stuff like that. And then it kind of morphed into sharing the Mastering Mayhem merch items that I was making. And then along the way, I kind of shared some DeWalt tool and obsessions that I've had. Hats off to Ira. I mean, I, I can't imagine doing it with small kids. But I, oh. That's, that's a lot of work. Well, this is a little chaotic, so. <laughs> My part really didn't start until Live Edge started. When we started Live Edge, I don't know, I, I felt different about everything. It felt real to me. I think everything started feeling real to him, you know, after the first few months because he was in the shop. It didn't really feel real to me until Live Edge started. And now I. I see this as my future too. I don't think I'll be a teacher much longer. (laughs) Because I wasn't quite niched enough, but I think because my channel name is I don't even work here, I think I'm just gonna roll with. I'm gonna put out some shorts for Sage. You know, one thing I'm, I'm good at probably more than anything else is business and understanding the way businesses work and how to how to run a business. And I always come at from very much the money ball approach. I don't wanna hit home runs. I just wanna get on base and get on base and get on base. And I think it's easier for people to look at my story, for example, or anybody like in a similar story and think that that was an easy decision. And I can't state how much that was a, or a very hard decision for both my wife and I. I like the premise of doing a tool review, comparing two tools, and especially if they are popular tools. You can make the life you want to, you can make the business you want to, whatever it is you want to make. It wasn't like YouTube's good and you know, this and that, like we don't, I was still, pretty new to YouTube and um, didn't know that that was sustainable long term. And so it was a gamble. And I'd worked for a long time to get in the position I was at. And it was a very, very hard decision to, to basically give that up for, you know, potentially the rest of my life. I never even considered the second channel. I just think all of my content needs to go where I am. It's uh, a lot of risk and and fear, but moving through those deliberately. There's a system 
to it and you 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 follow that system so what have you learned and done to try to change and so that's that's the thing i always do is um there's it is it's a continuous process of, of evolution scheduling and trying to edit and get a video out like it's just it's really hard to follow exactly if you do that and do it consistently it'll generate views interesting a lot of times you might see channels or businesses uh, that are frustrated because they're not growing and you look and you realize that for for years or dozens of iterations you look at the most recent and you go back a few years or a few dozen iterations and there's zero change i'd like to see channels evolve into more of like a channel like we're traditional like tv channel where you, you have a channel but there's different shows within that channel and you know you could have the segment for your shorts or your live streams and your your longs you know all these different things that people can kind of just pick and choose what they want to watch and my goal isn't to get the most views on youtube my goal is you know to provide confidence inspiration and knowledge through entertaining and engaging content so what's the next step what is the next thing what's going to get you to that next place you gotta get them to click you gotta get them to watch i i've I'm terrible at thumbnails. I hate doing them. I would stress so bad over doing them. I've actually hired somebody else to do them now. That's why they look different. I'm not doing them anymore. <laughs> I took that out of my hands and I'm stress free on that part. Another thing is also onboarding people that are better than me at, at something. So um, I have an editor I've been working with for about two years now. One day it just kind of hit me that, okay, I watch a lot of these videos and I obviously find value in them. Um, what? why can I not be the person on the other side of the camera, right? Providing the content and the information. With me being a business mind individual and trying to make sure that I'm providing for my family, but also always growing. Um, our audience smells authenticity and whether or not you're enjoy enjoying what you do very easy. I'll always be that individual that loves YouTube, that always wants to do extremely detailed videos on how to build. I feel like the biggest challenge is probably uh, getting yelled at to put on protective. I'm still focused on my woodworking. I'm focused on trying to get better. I just want to try new things and, and uh, break barriers and just be the best woodworker I can be and then document that. Um, I just don't really have the time or desire to really become a student of YouTube. So I'm always playing catch up. I'm always just doing the best I can to get the most out of what we're doing. But <laughs> I am no student of YouTube. That's for sure. A good plan of attack is to uh, create a channel on YouTube or, a, or an account on YouTube that you don't have any ties to. You've never watched anything on there and just start watching content you're interested in on that channel. Don't don't watch the news or don't click off and start watching, you know, the latest episode or whatever. Just use that account strictly for that. And that'll kind of start jumping up what's being surfaced to people. And then from there, you can kind of, you know, as far as equipment goes, and I, and I say this adamantly all the time, there is nothing I've ever made that I couldn't make by hand. You know, and I, I have a skill set that I've developed that I could make it by hand. Does having a CNC make it faster? You bet it does. A big change that I've seen is that people have gotten even uh, shorter attention spans than normal. So if you are going to start a YouTube channel and you're gonna start recording yourself working, keep the pace really, really fast. People get bored super quick. And when they get bored, they either start tapping those arrow keys to speed through the video, um, or else they'll just drag the slider across the screen so that they can speed through and skip to the end and see what you've built. But if you want to engage them throughout the whole video, you've got to keep the, pa the pace really, really fast. Basically structure your channel so that you generate more views. They watch one video, they're gonna watch the next, the next, the next. If you look and you can tell the difference in the, I can see it in my analytics, I can see it in the, in the, in the way my channel structured. The first thing that I would recommend to anybody, and this of course applies to any niche that you're looking to start a channel for, is before you even take the first steps in terms of researching and all that, which we'll talk about in a second, I would have a really honest conversation with yourself about what you're looking to get out of the channel and what your expectations are. As a rule of thumb, post-production takes uh, six times recorded footage length, not shoot time, but recorded footage length. So if you record a five minute clip, it's gonna take you a minimum of 30 minutes to edit that five minute clip, even if you only edit down into 30 seconds, because you have to watch it, then you make some notes and then you make uh, watch it again, you make some cuts and you watch it again. And then when it fits into the timeline, by a rule, 
you're going to see that same clip roughly six times. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. Lift off. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the live stream. We're here and we're trying to make Monday nights great. I hope you had a great day and a great weekend. And I welcome you to the live stream tonight. As always, we encourage you to chat with each other because the chat is where it's at. And you will get more out of this the more you put into it. And I think that you'll enjoy the social interaction between those who, who execute the chat. I also would encourage you, if you have questions for our guests, to make sure to put a Q at the beginning of the chat message. That way I recognize it as a question. And bring it back up and we'll try to get all the questions answered. If you are celebrating a milestone of any type, please put an M at the beginning of your chat message followed by your milestone. And we don't care whether that's a YouTube milestone or a milestone in life. Someone was born, someone's out on probation, someone graduated, whatever the case. Maybe you're celebrating a big vacation or an anniversary. We'd love to celebrate with you. So welcome. And let's bring on our guest. Our guest has over 24,200 subscribers on YouTube and his channel is growing quickly. His channel has a great name. It's his name. <laughs> so please help me welcome Scott Walsh. Hey. How are you? Good, RT. How are you? I'm doing good. Good to see you again. Yeah, for those that don't know, I met Scott in person at uh, WorkbenchCon and uh, we had some fun hanging out. And I um, hope you've been doing well, Scott. Yeah, it's been uh, pretty busy ever since I saw you last at WorkbenchCon. And, um, you know, with things going on in my life and trying to propel my channel forward uh, a little bit uh, here and there, it's, uh, it's, it's everything I got. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's not something that you can ever rest on your laurels. You have to keep pushing forward if you want it to grow. Yeah, it's unfortunate that uh, it becomes a bit of a rat race. Um, it sounds negative when I say it that way, but I still really like it. Emphasis yeah. on it, I still really like it. Yeah, I think most entrepreneurs, they may enjoy their work, but it's still work. Oh, yeah. And I think that's the same thing with YouTube. We may enjoy making videos and we may enjoy woodworking projects, but at times it is tedious, it's time consuming. Um, whenever you're sanding and you're working up those grits. I mean, it, it, it's not that fun, but nope. the payoff is there uh, yeah, and, sure. and the reward. Yeah, there's, there's things about content creation that I don't like. I don't like all the time I spend on a computer um, rather than being in the shop. And uh, it, there's just certain, I don't really like editing all that much. So there's just things that I like, things that I don't like, but I think overall, uh, I really do like it. Have you outsourced anything yet? Not yet, but I am working on it. Yeah. Okay. I started making plans recently for sale and I am spending way too much time making plans. And for some reason, I just can't figure out how to make it more efficient. So next time I'm just going to find someone to do it for me. And mm -hmm. uh, I don't care if they're not perfect. I don't care if it's not the way I would do it as long as I get done. I can move on with my life to the next video. Uh, I'm fine with that. Yeah. Um, AJ was on here last week talking about how he outsourced thumbnails, you know, yeah. and, and so I think that's a good idea. I mean, if it's, if you could find a way to make it affordable um, and you considering what your time is worth and you find the thing that you're not good at or the thing that bogs you down, then, then outsource it. Seems to make sense. I think the trickiest part is finding the right person and letting go of control because i think everyone in the diy community uh we all want to do it ourselves we want to do everything ourselves whether it's the editing or the project or the filming or the thumbnail or making plans for sale or whatever we we all know we have the ability to at least figure it out and try to do it 
So therefore we get caught in this endless train of, oh, I have to do everything uh, to make this whole system work. But realistically, uh, I can't do it because I can't uh, increase my video output because things are holding me back. Yeah, I, I think one of the tricks is to be engaged with whoever you're you're having do the work so that it doesn't lose your brand, if you know what I mean. You're, you know, if you have a certain way of editing, then that you need to carry that on to a certain extent. They might be able to improve some things, but you know, I don't think you want to do it in a way that would drive off the audience that you've built up. I mean, like any sort of management position, I guess communication is key. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, so yeah, like you said, like certain things like people are going to be better at you, like a video editor who has a ton of experience video editing, they're going to bring something new to the table that you definitely haven't figured out yet, or you haven't thought about yet. So it's definitely an opportunity to grow. But that initial jump is going to be scary for me. Editing is very important to me, so it's going to be difficult, but I'm hoping within the next year, I'll get someone editing my videos. Oh, wow. Oh. Well, that's a, that's a good goal. Uh, your, um, your videos, your most recent video, in my opinion, is your best video. And your, your videos have evolved over time and have shown and a definite improvement in my estimation. Um, they were all, always good. Uh, but you seem to have taken things to the next level. What's uh, what's your secret? It's the secret is to always be critical about yourself. It doesn't mean like getting down on yourself. It doesn't mean like everything I do is horrible and I need to change it every time. But thinking critically is just trying to take the most objective point of view as, pos as possible for your own content. It's very difficult because you're going to end up spending dozens of hours editing a video, looking at the same thing over and over and over again. And by the end of it, you're so exhausted and you have uh, a perspective that's totally skewed about what it is that you're delivering to the, to the audience. So you have to be able to rely on maybe a bit of time. So when you post it, take a couple of weeks away from that video and then come back to it. Then you can sit down and you can think about uh, areas for improvement. Then a really great resource that everyone should be using is uh, a good group of friends who are interested in the same things that you are. So if you're making YouTube videos, find other people who are making YouTube videos. They might not necessarily be in your space or in your community on YouTube, but if you can find people who are interested in making YouTube videos, become good enough friends with them that they're gonna be telling you the honest truth, not just saying, oh, another great video, yay, you did it, but actually telling you, okay, that sucked, that was good, but that sucked, and you know, it can be hard and it can hurt, but it's the only way you're going to improve really is if you can detect where you're going wrong and you have other people with a fresh perspective to detect where you need to improve as well. Yeah. I think, uh, finding someone that you trust, uh, to be honest with you is, is important. Um, I think some of that feedback though comes in the pre-production process, right? I mean, that's that kind of feedback is throughout the process, not just afterward, right? For sure. Um, a lot of it comes after the fact, but in pre-production or even during, yeah, you know, like the biggest way that you can kind of mitigate and prevent yourself from getting into too much trouble is to prepare more. And with me and my channel, what that is, is preparing a script. Whereas in the beginning, and I guess I'll go into uh, how I've evolved in a minute. In the beginning, I would just say, oh, I'm going to build this. So I'm going to plunk down my camera, hit record, and uh, we'll just see what happens after the fact in the edit. Let's see what happens, right? So go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, Suman is saying increase your gain. So is he talking about? My mic's too low. Your, your mic. All right, All Simon. Right. We we need some. Uh, we See, need some critical you got friends, thinking. Friends to give you honest opinions, right there. Yeah. Simon says to increase your gain. I increased it. I don't want to go too much. Don't want to blow right. your ears out. 
Suman, let us know if that uh, that sounds better. It sounds better to me. I'm sure he will. <laughs> so um, where was I? Yeah, writing a script, preparing. Now, a script is not going to be great for everyone, but even if you have an outline um, to keep you on track of what you want to say or whatever, but not focusing so much in the script, just preparing in general is going to mitigate a lot of things um, that might come up after that you might not like as much in the edit or when the final video is exported. So yeah, in, the only thing I can think of really in pre-production is just prepare. Yeah, um, that uh, pre-production preparedness, you know, we, um, we had Joseph from Jojax on here uh, yeah. talking about the steps, you know, the, the outline, the script, the, um, the board, the, the shot list, you know, so every little bit that you can put into that will save you time on the post-production. It will also allow you to go ahead and identify uh, weak points in your storytelling, right? I mean, you're, that's really what you're doing. You're, you're laying out a whole bunch of information. It's like telling a long story. You know, you, here's what you need to do now. Here's what you need to do next to have this great outcome. Yeah. Um, the script. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Scott. The um, yeah. Weak points in storytelling is definitely going to be solved by sitting down on your computer with a sheet of paper to really hash it out. I would, so, I, I want to say, I, I don't want to um, get too much into this, but some things might be a little bit more paralyzing than others. Uh, hashing out your script or whatever is great. Uh, but if you're venturing down the path of planning out a shot list for every single shot, you know, if you have one cool idea and you want to remember it, write it down for sure. But if you're like planning out a shot list or like planning out where you're going to put your lights, some things are just going to be a little bit too detailed, I think, for the audience and for the platform. We're not making, you know, festival films here where presenting information on YouTube that provides value to the audience. So if your shot list is a little sparse or you don't have a shot list, don't worry about that and don't let that paralyze you and stop you from making a good YouTube video because um, you don't need that level of detail as you would if you were making uh, a film, in my opinion. Other, you know, if, if you like doing it, then do it. But like, you know, you got to get the video done at some point. And I think the major part of preparing to a film is just the story or the script or just your bullet points. Yeah. I, I haven't gone through the process yet uh, with a with a good shot list. Um, it's something I want to try with with one of my next videos. But um, as I think about it, I just want to have the shots that I want to make sure that I get while I'm out there, yeah. while I'm filming, and make some notes about when not to make shots. You know, because I've been guilty before of letting the camera run while I run 32 boards through the table saw. And it's really, there's no point in it because then I've got to edit that down. And really, if I can get one good board through there, why do I need to film? every board. Totally. Oh, I 100% agree with you. Um, I guess for me, when I ha hash out a script or write down a bunch of notes with what I'll film, it's not technically a shot list, but it does guide me with what I what I want to shoot. Yeah. Now, what you're what you're doing recently, like with your with your last video, yeah, is, um, is is really instructional material. And I'm really liking that. Um, you recently also did, you know, selecting and building with construction lumber. Um, and you kind of had the the project as the background noise, right? I mean, that it wasn't front and center. So what's your thought process about uh, wrapping or, you know, surrounding your content around uh, around build projects? Yeah. Um, when I started making videos on YouTube, I started like many other people 
and just I'm building this so I'm going to plug my camera down hit record and I'm going to make a video about what I'm building that was as extensive as the story got because I you know I have been watching woodworkers on YouTube forever just building things so eventually I noticed the pattern that these videos weren't really performing that well um, and I probably made four or five just straight up build videos in the classic sense and when that wasn't working and this kind of goes back to what you're talking before talking about before like how do you know when to pivot well you know my numbers weren't growing so therefore i i knew i had to change i shouldn't be doing the same thing and expecting a, a different result it's just not going to happen so i knew i needed to pivot this is going to get a little long-winded i guess i'm going through my whole history here so some sometime you know within the first four or five videos i decided this isn't working so i'm going to change it up and how i did that was changing the entire format it was a hard pivot into a style of youtube video that would be commonly that would commonly be watched by maybe a younger audience i'm talking like teenagers uh if you're familiar with um youtubers like mr beast or Arak. now i'm not comparing the quality of my videos to theirs because theirs are obviously amazing but it's that super hyper fast editing uh in your face shouting at the camera and i think i was trying to achieve that sort of aesthetic in the end but this is the woodworking space. This is not really what people are used to in our space, this like really hyper style of video. I think I made, I wanna say three videos sort of in that style. And those didn't really do anything either. My, my numbers didn't grow. I had fun making them, but they were labor intensive in the edit. So I stopped making those really hyper uh, spastic editing style videos and it was around that time when I had met John uh, from Lincoln Street and his channel was picking up steam pretty quick immediately out of the gate. And what he told me back then was like, you know, our, our woodworking space on YouTube, in essence, at its core, it's an instructional space. It's people have this hobby and they want to go to YouTube and they want to learn about their hobby that they're passionate about. So, you know, that kind of brought me back down to earth, even though I, I kind of like this new style. It's like I had to admit defeat here because my numbers weren't growing again. So I really had to bring it back to what, what this space is truly about. And that's people have a hobby and they want to learn about it. So, you know, I guess I could teach. I don't know. I used to teach music to kids. So I just started preparing a script and like, okay, I'm going to tell people five beginner tips. And that was my first sort of instructional video. And it didn't really do that well off the gate. But, you know, if you're making a pivot, or if you're trying something new on YouTube, you might, it might take a while for a certain format to really bite or take off. So I did the one instructional video, it was okay. And then a couple more later, and then I started kind of getting the groove in. But I always felt like I was missing something uh, because just talking straight to a camera for 10, 15 minutes straight doesn't really feel like woodworking. It's not really what I, yeah, John, okay, thank you. <laughs> it doesn't really feel like woodworking if I'm not building anything. I was never uh, an audience, like if I was an audience member um, watching YouTube for woodworking content, I never used to watch instructional videos kind of like I make now. I used to watch build videos. And that was, I guess, the original intention of just starting a YouTube channel in general. I like to build stuff, so I'll make build videos. So I didn't really know much about instructional videos on YouTube, but I knew that when I started to make them, I didn't really enjoy it because it was just all talking head. So, um, so I kind of sat down and talking with my friends, John and Suman, you know, we kind of, you know, how can we maybe combine the two? So for that construction lumber video that you mentioned, you know, I was like, oh, well, maybe I can keep it like instructional focused. So like really the A story, the A story, the main story of the video can be an instructional sort of lecture style of video or a talking head style video. And maybe in the background, like as sort of like a little, uh, 
breather moments in between lessons or whatever you want to call it, there can be this build in the background. So a while back, I had this idea of, uh, I, I want to teach people how to use construction lumber like you would with fine furniture lumber. So how could you make a piece of fine furniture just using construction lumber? And everyone thought that was a good idea and that has a broad appeal and it could everyone might like that. So I, I kind of put it together, but I needed a project. And this was the first time I made a video about a project that I actually didn't need. So what do I build? Well, I have construction lumber. I guess I'll just make a coffee table. I don't need a coffee table. So I just called up a friend of mine and I asked him, do you want me to build you a coffee table? And he said, yeah, that'd be great. So the, the point of the video at its essence was let's uh, make an instructional video about construction lumber. And the side or the background or the B story was making the coffee table. That wasn't the goal. The coffee table wasn't the goal of the video. The coffee table was sort of a product of the video. So it wasn't the main focus. And I think that that sort of background really helped people stay engaged with an otherwise uh, straight, talk nonstop talking which can get really boring so i that was a long-winded way of arriving at the, the answer to your question there but i think i i summed up um sort of my journey here thus far on youtube yeah that's uh that, that is a great summary one of the one things that i liked about your most vi recent video uh, with the finishes is I saw the thumbnail and, you know, it shows this, I think it's like good, better, best, or worst, good, best, or something like that. And, and there's a lot of thumbnails. I'm not saying they're like yours, but they're similar to that. And then you get into the video and the person spends 20 minutes explaining why they think this product is good and why this product is better than that one and this is the very best product but your creative way of combining not just a comparison you weren't looking at individual products but hey you can take this kind of uh, finish on construction material and here's a process i use to get good results then i can take this next one and get a different kind of result, but I use this process. And I appreciated that kind of instruction um, as you went along. And it wasn't just another, okay, here's three different types. I'm gonna tell you which one's the best. Versus, yeah. versus videos are great, but they can be so subjective whenever it comes to stain and finishing. Oh, and finishes are so subjective. And uh, that was probably the most flack I got in the comments out of any video, but you know, it is what it is. But yeah, I didn't really mention it in that video, but I, I did want it to be um, like, you can use any of those methods with any of those finishes more or less, right? So, and all of those finishes you could find at the home center. Oh, and and I totally ripped that thumbnail off of everyone else too. I think John may have used a similar style and I think maybe I've seen, yeah, Maleki does that a lot too. So, you know, you gotta, if you see something that's working, you gotta try and use it. And where that, previous back in january my construction lumber video you know that really took off for me um i i wanted to repeat something in the same sort of vein so that's why it was a a finishing and stain video dedicated to construction lumber realistically it had nothing to do with construction lumber but that's how i packaged it because that's how uh something worked for my channel in the past right so it's not that i like repeated the same video or i like double down on the same video like oh i i, I need to make another how to make furniture at a construction lumber video over and over and over that's pretty shallow and that's not really going to really um do me well in the long term but at least it's sort of in the same vein now i'm not saying that going forward i have to keep doing construction lumber videos because i definitely don't want to do construction lumber videos but at least every now and again i could kind of go back and i know that there's a huge uh, subset of my audience who have subscribed to my channel because of that construction lumber video and that might catch their eye yeah and it um yeah. it makes a it makes a set of videos so if somebody comes there for the construction lumber, then they can have a binge session on your channel 
without ever going into other areas like your build videos or you you know if you move on and do hardwood videos or whatever the case may be yeah so so again it sets um uh, it sets up a portfolio for you for viewers to binge for a while on your channel i think that can always be beneficial yeah i suppose i should make a playlist out of it then i guess <laughs> yeah a playlist would be uh recommended i think that'd be great so you mentioned um maleki who uh, definitely has um is a success on youtube uh what how do you compare what maleki's doing and the entertainment value uh to what someone else is doing maybe cam at blacktail or or what you're doing how does that all work out in your mind so that first sort of pivot that i did with my channel i guess was in the same vein that maleki is doing now um or he was doing it back then too probably but he is definitely in the entertainment camp like you said and um I would be curious to see what his uh, his audience age range skews as, but he is definitely using that same style of editing that uh, folks like Eric or Mr. B star to be super in your face, super quick, super hype, hy hyper in that. And it's working for him, but I honestly, off the top of my head, I can't really think of any other channels that in our space that are being successful using the same editing style as he is. I tried it, didn't work for me, but um, I believe that in the beginning for his channel, I could be wrong about this, I'm trying to remember, but I think he started his channel more instructional, more like this is how you pour epoxy river tables and that sort of thing. And he has morphed into something more entertainment based, which is working for him at his level. But for for what I was trying to do last year, um, I, I didn't have the audience for it. And I don't think he can capture an audience at an entertainment level in a hobby space because uh like i said before i believe that people in the woodworking space or it could be any other hobby like knitting or baking or who whatever they're coming to youtube primarily to learn something you know i, I guess if they get some entertainment while they're learning that's a bonus and that's probably going to make them fall in love with you better and subscribe to you and watch all your videos but i think the uh, I think your primary uh, objective should be providing value to your audience first, uh, and then everything else is gravy on top of that. Yeah, absolutely. Now you, we talked. You talked about uh, entertainment and educational and, and build videos. Um, everybody's personality is different. Everybody will come across different on camera you have uh become very comfortable on on camera in your videos and you're you're coming across more like the scott that i i met in atlanta uh <laughs> more now than than some of your older videos not a criticism we no, no, no. We're, we're all trying to improve um what, what did you do to make yourself more comfortable in front of the camera and and come across with that authenticity that you have now Oh man, I don't think I'm authentic in camera at all, but it is something that I think about constantly, probably more than anything else. When I sit down and write my scripts, the information that I'm writing down, um, like I, I already know what I want to talk about. So it's easy for me to just write what I want to say, but it's the, how do I say it? Or how am I writing my script that I spend a lot of time analyzing and thinking about and i'll write something down and then i'll recite it out loud by myself in, in my office here and people probably think i'm nuts but like i i want to be able to say everything or i want to write everything down the way i would say it normally but the way that people talk one-on-one -on -one, like you and i are doing here or in person at a bar or whatever the, the way people talk is not proper uh english people don't uh, say proper sentences uh, with proper punctuation. It's all just a mishmash and, and whatever. Like, I guess people who are better at English than I am uh, could probably talk like a novel, but I think that is probably pretty rare. And authenticity on camera for me is realistically, it's just talking the way you would normally uh, in real life.
but trying to do that in front of a talking to a camera is one of the most abnormal things you could possibly do because you have all these thoughts running through your head that are not what you want to say it's how how am i looking how are my eyebrows right now how, like is there something on my nose like um or do people think i look funny am i slouching all these things are running through your head uh rather than what you should be talking about and rather than um speaking normally so talking to a camera is extremely difficult and i do not claim to be an expert or any good at it i just i just hyper analyze it all the time so a little while back when i was making this sort of transition into more instructional content um I, I can't remember who bought one first i don't know if it was john or suman my my buddies one of them bought a teleprompter first and they said oh you got to get this it's making recording so much more efficient because i'm not uh fumbling my words and i'm not uh saying the same line 10 times to uh, make sure i said it right so i was like okay well i, I want to be more efficient while filming so i bought the teleprompter too and it did make me more efficient i could film the video really fast but it actually um for me at least it, it made it harder to be more authentic on camera than it did uh help it it just helped being more efficient and being faster filming so it was very easy with a teleprompter to just dead stare into the camera and read the lines like one after the other like a news reporter would um trying to inject some sort of uh, authenticity and personality while using a teleprompter is hard because when people talk to each other in real life you're not always dead stare right into people's eyeballs that would be really weird that would be scary actually but people look away and they have they have thoughts and they pause and they think so trying to do that with a teleprompter um was just a whole nother level so long-winded answer again i'm sorry but uh, authenticity is super important to me and it's something i work on all the time tips for doing it I, I don't know i just i i watch myself back over and over and i watch people who i want to be like so i don't know if anyone's familiar with someone like peter mckinnon i think him on camera is just a, a perfect model of authenticity and which is probably why he has six or seven million subscribers uh peter mckinnon is in it he's in the photography and videography space on youtube uh but he can just sit in front of the camera and talk straight for four minutes without saying any ums or ahs he's probably not using a teleprompter either um but he's he's just super charismatic and i that's what i want to be like i just want to be super charismatic and it's something that i'm going to continue to work on every single time i film a video yeah well, that's, uh, that's what this is all about and getting us to progress a little bit each time. You know, whenever you're, you're talking about having a direct conversation with someone, you know, you, like you say, you know, you're looking at them, but you might glance to the side. You, you, you might pause for a second. You know, you look away at the dog running by or yeah. whatever the case may be, but the conversation just continues. And Part of that is that feedback that you get from the other person, their verbal and nonverbal indicators on the way the conversation is going. With the camera, there is no nonverbal. You know, the camera is the same all the time when I'm looking at it. So yeah. I don't get those that feedback, that instant feedback. So I don't know if I'm uh, doing something weird, if I'm dragging my words too much, if I'm trying to talk too fast. Am I trying to recite something as I scripted it out, uh, which is not natural English as you speak, like you said? So um, all, all great points, Scott. Um, so you were talking earlier about stepping back, examining what you're doing, taking those hard steps to take a hard look at, at your success and what you really want to do. And then as needed, pivot the channel, pivot your direction. So if you're talking to someone else and giving them advice, how do they, how do you recommend that they know when it's time to pivot their channel, pivot the direction that they're going with it? I mean, when it's not working, um, 
something is up if your channel is not growing. It's very difficult to grow a channel, I know. But if you're doing the same thing over and over and your numbers aren't changing, then you obviously, the writing's on the wall. You kind of need to think critically about what you're doing and figure out what to do next. Because if you continue to do it in the same way, you're going to get burned out and you're not going to have fun anymore because you're not going to gain anything from YouTube. So I guess a couple of indicators of that are going to be comments. I mean, comments are tough, right? You're going to, you're going to get a lot of like positive comments that are going to be like, good job. You know, this was great, but they're not really like, you can tell that they're not just like someone who's like been really moved or changed by your content. So if you're getting kind of just mediocre, like, uh, like good video, whatever, I would just think really hard about how, how you want to change people uh, with your content. Like how do you want people to learn from what you're doing? And if you have provided some information that has totally changed your perspective uh, on the subject of your video. And then there are negative comments and, you know, we all get negative comments and a lot of people ignore negative comments and for good mental health, I, you know, I would encourage you to not really read too deeply in them, but at the same time, I wouldn't completely ignore them either. I think a lot of negative comments come from some sort of place of truth from the person who wrote it. Now, maybe they didn't write it in the most um, constructive way that they could have. They probably, um, they, they pr most likely didn't intend it to hurt you, but the way you read it, it probably it did hurt quite a bit. But I, I would really encourage you to take a step and take a look at where the negative commenter is coming from. Um, I don't know, like if 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 they're saying something like, oh, this was a snooze fest or whatever, then then obviously maybe you need to pick up the pace in the next video. Um, I guess in the end, just don't ignore the negative comments um, to a certain degree. Yeah, on the comment front, you know, that it's according to what kind of negative comment it is. But if, if you can find something constructive in it, then then why not consider it and apply it, you know? People have made comments, you know, about the length of my forehead. Well, I can't, I can't do anything about that. That's going to be the same. But if somebody makes a comment and they have, um, hey, the videos, uh, the music is too loud on this video. You know, they're helping me out that I can be more aware of that next time I make a video. Um, or if they, you know, point out this was the pace wasn't good. I had to watch this on two times speed and it was still too slow. Okay. They're yeah. telling me, they're telling me what I need to do. Um, yeah. they, they may be doing it out of frustration, but they're giving me some clues on, on what I need to change. Yeah, exactly. I mean, at the same time, it's easy to blame the algorithm like this, mm. this algorithm, like, that if your channel's not going well, like, you know, oh, YouTube's against me. <laughs> YouTube, I don't know. I, I might be in the minority of this opinion, but YouTube is not against you. YouTube wants to make money. So they want to give good content to the masses. And if they're not pushing your content, then it's, I'm sorry to say, but like that they don't deem it good enough to show to a lot of people because they're going to show it something else that they know it can get a lot of eyeballs and get a lot of eyeballs on advertisements to make them a lot of money. So I, there's nothing in YouTube that is trying to inhibit your growth. They're just trying to make the most money at the end of the day. So I, I, I find it very difficult to blame YouTube for any inadequacies that my videos have. Absolutely. Cause they're, they're actively trying to stay in business and to make a profit. Yep. And to do that, they have to keep eyeballs watching their screens. So yep. They are not in the business to reward you as a video creator. They're in the business to provide their viewing customers the videos that they want to watch. And how do they find that? They find that through the 
um, through the statistics, through the measurements of success of that video. And if you have the best video in the world that will retain people 100% and everybody's going to click on the thumbnail, then guess what? You would be the first one listed for everyone. But, you know, the, the, there is no perfect video for everyone. You've got yeah. to find your niche. You've got to build it so that it's clickable, so they're on the right subject at the right time. And then once they get into it, they have to have to watch it. Um, I mean, we've all heard it before, too. The audience changes and you got to change with the audience. It's not the fact that YouTube is changing. It's audience is changing. And even though I've only been on YouTube for less than two years, I've definitely noticed a shift since the sort of the pandemic has kind of subsided and people <clears throat> have gone back to normal life. Uh, there's a lot less eyeballs on YouTube uh, than there was a couple of years ago when I started. Sure. Yeah. And got a milestone here. We, uh, from first fruits design company, we got our first negative comment. Yeah. Super exciting. Good it job. is, it is, you know, you, you got to get that first one out of the way. Um, you, enough people have not watched your videos until you start seeing some negative comments. Appalachian heritage Woodshop says some negative comments are constructive. Not uh, all of them though. I, I recently had one where someone told me I needed to work out. Oh, they just like, oh, you're you're too skinny. You need to work out. Actually, you know what? They're probably not wrong. So that is constructive. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's that has nothing to do with your I, videos. I'm skin and bones here, RT. Like I can almost get my arm or my fi fingers around my bicep. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're lean, Scott. You're lean. Lanky. I'm lanky and healthy. Yeah. Um. So Appalachian which Heritage Woodshop also says good content or popular content. You know, and there's uh, good content is popular content, unfortunately. Yeah, it's uh, it's all about the the audience. You know, the Mr. Beast is is casting a wider net um, than the woodworking sector. You know, he's 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 uh, grabbing entertainment from all areas, right? But yeah. uh, but we we are defining our niche and you know somebody that likes to watch ep epoxy videos might not like to watch wood turning you know and then there's some of us that like it all so uh, yeah really i mean depends. there's niches within woodworking like if you're a hand tool woodworker then realistically that is like woodworking is one niche but then within woodworking there's like turning there's pure hand tools there's epoxy tables but some of those niches are bigger than others so it's realistically the size of the audience that you're going for but if you're staying within that woodworking umbrella for me at least i want to kind of cast an umbrella over all, a bunch of niches at the same time to maximize the audience that i'm going for it may sound shallow but realistically uh i'm trying to grow a business here so like i i, I have to uh find the balance between the content that I want to make, I want to make and the content that the viewers want to make. And usually the scale tips uh, towards what I think the viewers want. Yeah. And if anybody is viewing this, that has different goals, if they don't care about growth, they just want to make videos for themselves and, and they really don't care about building it into a business. You, you can, you can choose to ignore any and all of this information that Scott is sharing, but if you want to, build up your subscribers and be able to provide a service to more viewers on YouTube, then uh, this might be good advice. Dusty Trails Workshop says, um, a way to gain traction when you're starting from the ground up. So what, what advice would you give a brand new YouTuber? Um, okay. I'm going to try and not repeat what John said on his, uh, his live stream many months ago, but I will say that you should look at what content is working in our space and what content is not working in our space. So look at the big channels and go through their past videos within the last year, last, eh, let's say last year, see what's working for them, see what's not working for them. And if you do that enough and you take a lot of notes, you're going to start to notice a lot of patterns. And then you're going to start to see a lot of patterns and thumbnails and titles as well, which, you know, is a whole nother conversation, but you kind of have to balance like 
what the what topics are out there that are working for people and then recognize, oh, I have something to say about that. And if you want to watch a whole bunch of videos about the same topic, you can kind of see like, oh, well, no one has said what I want to say. And I think I have a unique opinion about it. But I already know this is a broad topic and I know that people want to watch it because I've seen the same topic on a bunch of other people's channels and they're all doing well. But I have a unique take on it. So make that video. Make a video that you know is popular, that you know people want to watch and that you have a unique thing to say about it. Yeah. We are getting all kind of comments. Got a comment here says, uh, talking about your size, Scott says you're a healthy <laughs> two by four instead of a two by eight. Am I a, am I a true two by four, like a, a, a vintage full two inches by four inches? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know if we're talking about uh, eight quarters. Uh, yeah, stuff. yeah. Um, something you know now that you wish you knew from the start. So I think you kind of went over that. Anything else you want to add on that topic? Um. I'm not discounting the the lessons that I learned the hard way in the beginning. I'm glad that I shifted and I pivoted away from it. Um, but, you know, I had to make three or four build videos to realize, to learn that lesson that they're not working. Um, build videos still work for some people. You know, you have your Jason Hibbs, like he, he makes a, a banger of a video every single week. And it's essentially a build video, but people go to him for his personality, right? Uh, and his awesome woodworking skills and his crazy projects. But yeah, it's, I, I like where I am right now. I wish I could make more videos, but yeah, like you, I think just at the end of the day, like I wish I, I had kind of um, done a bit more research to what is working and not working for other people. You know, that's one thing I keep going back to is I, I wish I would have uh, done more research instead of just press record. Um, I'm, I'm still struggling uh, to grow a channel, but but I feel like I've learned a lot. But, you know, at the time that I started, I didn't even know about the YouTube partner program and and that was there was any potential to make any money. I just wanted to make some videos. Um, so it's been a uh, fun journey so far. I do want to um, tell people that next week, uh, being the fourth, we are, you know, we are seven months into this um, journey doing uh, live streams every week. So next week for the 4th of July, we're going to take a week off. And wow. so we'll be back here in two weeks. Happy so, vacation. Uh, yeah. Uh, Independence Day here in the United States. So yeah. We will um, hopefully be having a good time somewhere, and I will see you the uh, the next week. So let's see. I want to make sure I didn't miss any questions. So, Scott, who who are you watching now that you're gaining the most inspiration from? In specifically the woodworking space or outside? Um. Uh, Either one or both. Tell, tell us about both. Hmm. Let's see. I already mentioned this before, um, but Peter McKinnon, who is not in the woodworking space, um, he's been around forever. And I've been watching his videos kind of on and off for quite a long time. But I only really recently kind of clicked to me like, like this guy knows how to talk to a camera really well. He is so charismatic. And he's really someone who I look up to in terms of the ability to speak to camera because I don't see many people, especially not in the woodworking space, but I don't see many people who are truly gifted, truly talented, and truly have put in the hard work to be able to talk to camera so effectively, so efficiently, so charismatically as Peter McKinnon does. So I really love watching him. I don't even listen to what he's saying. I just watch and I'm like, dang, I... I I want to be like that. So in the woodworking space, I haven't been watching as much woodworking content recently. Let me take a quick gander riveting. I know. Um, 
Yeah. I haven't been watching a whole lot. I appreciate um, a few channels. I, I haven't been watching them recently, but um, Johnny Brook from Crafted Workshop, he has such a um, structure to his content. And it's so, so when you click on his content, he's so consistent, you know exactly what you're going to get every time. Um, there's also Cam from Blacktail. His um, thumbnails are awesome. His narrations are awesome. He always delivers with his promise in his thumbnail. Um, let's see, who else am I looking at recently? Yeah, I guess that's it. I'm, I'm mainly kind of not w watching as much woodworking content unless there's a certain sort of topic that's blowing up and I kind of want to keep up with it. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, there, there's so many creators out there now, you know, and I know, you know, that Cam has been super successful and his, uh, his woodworking is more of a art form than, than I'm going to actually build, but, it, but occasionally I like to watch that kind of thing because it's, uh, it's almost hypnotic you know to, yeah. that, that working with epoxy stuff uh is just pretty cool yeah. um but you know I'm, I'm still you know there's a lot of a lot of woodworkers that are that are doing great things and i try to try to keep up on many of them you know 731 um i still try to keep up with steve ramsey i'm trying to keep up you know King's Fine Woodworking, I think, just released a video. I hadn't even got around to watching it yet yeah, because of being so busy. You know, and I think that's everybody now. The pandemic's, you know, the bulk of it's past us and, and we can really get back out there doing work. And it's summertime. We've got family activities. It's hard to find time. And although we don't like to talk about it, we're all one big happy woodworking community here on YouTube we are competing for eyeballs at the same time uh, because there's only so much time in a day that somebody can watch videos. Yeah. I, I maybe I just, maybe uh, you're probably right. I don't think about it as a competition because I guess for my mind, I, I don't think it's very healthy because I, I don't think I'm a very competitive person. Um, I think that there's opportunity for everyone to uh, make a good video and have it perform really well given the the effort and the time and the the dedication to it but yeah i think you're totally right this summer especially people are not wanting to look at their computer screens very much they're out they're having fun they're socializing after the past two years of misery so um <laughs> and even i find that the creators are slowing down too um i don't know if they're just taking the summer off as well but i feel like there's a lot less output from a lot of popular creators i don't know if they're getting burned out from it because the views are down or maybe they're just taking it easy over the summertime yeah so what um what's your outlook on a release schedule hmm uh look i wish i could release a video like once every two weeks and have it be the same quality that i want it to be like the the one video that performed really well for me did um but yeah, realistically, like I, I can't do that. Like I touched on before, though, I'm trying to let go things. I want to outsource uh, uh, plan making plans for people to buy. Um, eventually, I would love to get someone to edit my videos. Uh, those two things alone would free up a lot of time for me to produce more content. Um, but I, I gotta, I gotta find my path there, and I'll get there eventually. Yeah. So would I like to do it? Yeah. Is it ideal? It's only ideal to release a video on a consistent schedule if you can guarantee that it's going to be just as good um, as other good performing videos on your channel are. So, like, don't just make a video every Saturday for the make it for the sake of making a video every Saturday if you can't put the same quality into it. Quality has to come first. Always quality over quantity, any day of the week. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we got another question. What are some key indicators, metrics, for where you fit in regards to the niche? So where you fit into your niche. Um, so I guess 
you kind of define your niche first. Like, are you a wood turner within the woodworking within the YouTube community? Like, is that your sort of niche within a niche, for example? So if you know what your niche is, go find all the people in your niche who are the top performers and see how their videos are doing within the past year. And, you know, you can, you can compare your numbers to them. That's that's kind of the only way I can kind of think about it. It's not a comparison game, but you can use uh, YouTube. You can use all the numbers that YouTube will show you for other channels and for your own to gauge how you're doing within your niche. You just need to figure out what your niche is. And uh, for the most part, stay in your lane. Yeah, it's, stay in your lane. I, I don't mean that in like uh, like <laughs> like put, put you in your place sort of thing but um my buddy john had the recent experience where he made a video about his youtube growth on his woodworking channel and that video did extremely well for him but when he posted a new video about woodworking um signs indicated that maybe this audience that had tuned in to his youtube video about youtube uh, they were not interested in woodworking and it seemed to hamper his woodworking content for his next video. So if you're, let's say a wood turner, and then you post a video about building a cabinet, I think that's fine. But if you are a wood turner and then you post a video about personal finances, that is definitely not okay. I, you can't just make a YouTube channel about anything. You can't, you can't make a Seinfeld uh, channel about nothing, you know, and do it about everything. Yeah, our um, uh, Marius from uh, Mastering Mayhem, yeah, just started a second channel called the Versus channel because he had a group of videos that have been doing well on his channel when it's Versus videos, you know, the Makita versus the Dewalt con subcompact drill. And those type of videos were doing well. So, but it was not necessarily supporting his other videos. So he's going to break those out into their own channel and call it the Versus channel. And so now he's going to have a separate channel for that. So yeah. I think um, staying in your lane um, may require something like that. If you, if you find that one section of videos is distracting from another, you may have to separate them out or just focus on the on the one. And yeah. Supporting multiple channels is challenging. Oh, totally. I was just going to say, don't spread yourself too thin. I mean, that's great that uh, Marius found what's working, but yeah, recognized and needed to do a separate channel. Uh, but for me, I would never be able to make a separate channel about a separate, cho separate topic because it just takes too long for me to produce a video. Um, so I would just be already spread too thin and like you can go a month or a bit longer without posting a video and it's okay but if you're into like the three or four months without posting a video uh youtube's gonna start forgetting about you unfortunately <laughs> i'm sorry rt <laughs> i realized that as i was saying it <laughs> oh no no it's it's fine i uh, i have a lot of hours at work and i have yep. for a while now and my other channel um, has suffered for it. Thank goodness I have this channel and this community, and uh, we continue to show up every Monday night except next week. Except next week. Yeah. All right, Jarmade. Um, this is our buddy here. When are we doing a collaboration? LOL. Uh, I, well, I, sorry, Jesus. I live in a different country. It's a bit hard. There's this border thing, and they I passports and stuff. I don't know. <laughs> you have to do uh, a, uh, yeah, a collaborations distance. are tough. Um, I'm not discounting it. I'd love to collaborate. I just love to go and hang out with people from like from Workbench Con and meeting you and just hanging out at the bar with everyone. That was so fun. I just yeah. want to go out and meet people. And when I do that, I kind of feel like I don't even want to make a video. I just want to like go have fun. But um, <laughs> collaborating is tough. Like when I think about like um, collaborating with another woodworker, because I'm not really like into the idea of like a build video, like as a standalone video, 
um, I feel like it would be tough for me to do a collab, but maybe it would be something more like a, a, a information collab. Like if you had like two teachers on the screen at the same time, I don't know. I don't know how that would work, but I think there's something to be explored there. Yeah. You know, it's, um, you have to, you have to get creative, I think. Um, and he says, fair enough. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, so many logistics. Yeah. Um, oh, and John confirmed what you were saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, he, he had many uh, sleepless nights over that. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, earlier, I saw this when I saved it because I thought it was funny. Whenever you were talking about outsourcing. I think they uh, call that a time saver or one of those wide belt sanders. And yes, yeah. I do want a wide belt sander, but no, I don't think I can fit it in my basement shop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we would all like to uh, to outsource sanding sometimes, but but you know that's uh, that, that's what brings in the value, right? I mean, it's the fine finish that uh, will will make the, such a difference on a on a project. Uh, yeah. and, and I think about uh, there used to be. I used to live in Charlotte, North Carolina, mm -hmm. and there was a store down the street. And I forget the name of it, but they all they sold was unfinished furniture and you know <laughs> and so people would go pick that up and they would think that they could just slap on some stain and and it would all turn out great but it was unfinished wood i mean there was nothing sanded or and everything's assembled you know so if you have a 48 piece uh rocking chair you know 48 pieces of wood they built a rocking chair and they haven't sanded anything. Oh, it's just rougher on the edges. And, and, and so you would buy it and you think, oh, I got such a good deal on this, such a good price. Then you got home and if you didn't spend two days of sanding, it wasn't going to turn out well anyway. What a great business model, though. You got to hand yeah. it to them. I mean, like like the woodworking part, I think at that level, it's pretty quick. Like maybe they cut it out on a CNC or something like that. And they just kind of slapped it together with some screws. But the time consuming part, like the sanding and the finishing that would really cost them money, they're just handing it off to the customer and the customer thinks they got a fantastic, I'm, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. Yeah. They, they, people would load up their trucks with their new furniture. So excited. <laughs> And then you'd hear these horror stories about what That's happened funny. next. <laughs> well, actually, so I had just um, built a workbench uh, for myself. It's going to be my next video, hopefully coming out later this week, maybe. I don't know. But um, I got, speaking of sanding, I got so tired of sanding right away on this project. And it was a massive project. So much sanding to do. I was just like, I, I can't deal with this. I have an old sander. Just uh, it was like a $60 cheap sander. And I just marched out to Lee Valley and I came home with a new Merca and it just made my life so much easier. So I get it. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the right tool for the right job. It, it's a luxury, but I, I really love it. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's see if anyone had a question that I missed. I apologize, but I think we we got them all. Um, Scott, what else would you like to share with us? Let's see. Um, I, we covered authenticity. We kind of covered my, um, my sort of my, my two pivots, my two major pivots that I made. Um, something that I touched on, but I didn't really go into about like those kind of three different styles of videos that I have sort of been meandering through is kind of how it affected my productivity. And I've been talking about how I want to outsource plans because I want to be more productive. I want to get more videos out because I'm just like, my, my output is low, it's too low. So what I found initially when I was making those build videos, when I just kind of plopped the camera down, pointed it at what I was building and built it, and I went and edited it. Those videos were not really that time consuming to make because the the bulk of the work was sitting down, going through the hours of footage, only cutting out the good parts and shipping it out to YouTube. It wasn't too bad to make. Realistically, it could have been quicker if I made like a shot list or something like that. Otherwise, it was fine. 
when I started making those entertainment based videos like John Malecki makes, those were super time consuming to make, mainly because there was no plan. And there was no um, structure that I could make. So I would just get into the editing. And I had this this crazy diverse bunch of video files in front of me. All I could do was just put them in the timeline in a chronological order. And then I had to figure out how to make it funny and entertaining through editing. So that involved doing a bunch of graphics and finding funny video clips to insert in there and finding pictures and things like that to kind of ham up and make it fun, make what I was saying kind of funny and entertaining. And the music had to be perfectly timed. So everything kind of hit you and, and really kind of sent it home. But that took dozens of hours editing. I'm not even lying. Like it, it took so, so long to edit those videos and it was absolutely draining, which is another reason why I wanted to pivot away from it. So editing style does affect productivity. And when you make a plan, and you kind of stick to maybe more of an instructional type of video like I'm making these days, um, that plan is really guides you to not have a bunch of extra footage and to just being able to edit edit a whole video within a day or or more, depending how 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 detailed you want to be with it. I'm still struggling with that because. Uh, from a past career, like I, I, I just focus on the details a little bit too much for my, for that gets in the way of my productivity. So, you know, it, it's, it's tough for me to be churning out videos more, but I feel like through my critical thinking, through changing and pivoting ever so slowly, and I'm able to speed up my output, um, and lower the effort and increase the productivity that I'm, that I'm using to make my videos. So yeah, I don't know. It's tough. I'm just trying to balance what I think the audience wants to making good videos and what I can do personally. Well, any type of balance in life is always a, uh, is always a, a challenge, but I think it, it is here. And if you can find ways to make it more efficient, then I think you find ways that you can enjoy your your um, your hobby even more. Yeah. In your future business, right? Yeah, I think I struggle with this whole like analysis paralysis uh, thing where I just get stuck too much on the details and I just need to move on and let them go. And like this whole idea of like perfectionism, I don't claim to strive towards perfectionism, but I think I try and make everything too perfect and it just slows me down too much. So let the details go, people. Let them go. <laughs> um, a little bit of imperfection makes you more approachable from an audience standpoint. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I try and show my mistakes in terms of woodworking, but when it comes to video creation, I don't show my mistakes. <laughs> I, think, I think that's kind of what I'm trying to deal with now. <laughs> I got you. Got another question here. In your opinion, with the view count returning to pre-corona numbers, yeah. do you feel the attention span and patience for long-form video will also return? Yeah, um, I'm not sure if it ever went anywhere personally, but uh, it's. I think there's always going to be a place for long-form content as long as you see Netflix and you know, Prime Video and all these streaming services flourish, which they are, those are kind of barely any different in terms of attention span than YouTube. So if you're producing quality videos that people want to watch, they're gonna watch them no matter how long they are, whether they're five minutes, 10 minutes, 15, 20 minutes. You know, Jason Hibbs will put out a 30, 35, 40 minute video once a week uh, and people wanna watch it. People are watching a significant portion of his videos. Otherwise, he would never be where he is today. And he makes very long videos. So uh, there's always going to be a place for long form content. I don't think YouTube is going anywhere. This whole TikTok reels, YouTube shorts thing, I think is reserved for a different, um, I want to say audience or demographic, but it's it's a different setting. Like if, if like YouTube shorts is, 
the same thing as Reels. It's the same thing as TikTok. It's for when people just need like a quick three minute break from their job or whatever like that. They just kind of open their phone and they they doom scroll through shorts. But that to me is completely different than long form content. Long form content, people are sitting down. You can look at your metrics and you can see how many people are watching your content on a TV versus a computer versus a phone. And, and more and more as time goes on, I find people are watching my content on TVs and tablets. Um, phones are pretty big too. Um, computers, I don't know. I think I'm in the minority because I watch YouTube on my computer. <laughs> I do too. I watch it on the computer. Um, maybe yeah. it's because of my bad eyesight now. Uh, <laughs> and I don't like staring at the phone. But, uh, but you know, I know people watch it on TV. I think um, attention spans, you know, with YouTube, YouTube has made it user-friendly to leave a video and find another one. You know, they, if you turn your phone sideways, they're giving you suggestions while you're watching a current video. Yeah, so, but I think realistically, it's YouTube is trying to keep people on the platform but mm -hmm. they're not necessarily trying to keep them on your video. They mm -hmm. only care as long as they're on the platform. So if they're if they detect that people are tuning out and getting bored, they would rather feed someone another video on their own platform rather than someone getting up and walking away from the <laughs> entire platform. So it, it's it's you, like you as the creator are totally in charge of trying to keep people watching your own video. YouTube doesn't care. YouTube just wants to keep people on the platform. So you got to create engaging content or, and content that's packed with value to make sure people are staying on your video. Yeah, they want them to stick around. They want them to watch ads. Yeah. They, they, they want to do that. So for them to stick around with your video, it's going to have to maintain their interest. You know, and, and you were talking about Netflix and, you know, Disney Channel, whatever else is out there. What they're doing is they're keeping people's interest with visuals and storytelling. Yeah. And whenever we can incorporate more of that into our videos, I would think the reward for retention would, would be there. It's always it's always the challenge, right? How how are you going to continue to keep the viewer watching your video? Yeah. You know, I forget who it was that said uh the uh, the YouTube viewer is always looking for a reason to leave. So don't give them a reason to leave. Yeah, I don't know. That might have been Mr. Beast. Um, but uh, yeah, they're always looking for a reason. Like if if their attention goes, that's it. Like you, you've lost them. So you got to keep them engaged and you got to do everything that you can. So for me personally, what I do is uh, it's lots of value. Make sure they're always learning something. Make sure I'm not just regurgitating information that everyone else is uh, telling, uh, putting my own original spin on things. And I'm trying to have fun and be pleasant while doing it, too, to kind of keep that entertainment value there. Right. And because it's woodworking, you got to give them a bit of woodworking, too. I know I don't make build videos, but you, you got to have that element in there somewhere. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what it got them to your channel. Suman says, what's the most efficient filming and editing style process someone can do in our niche? Yeah. Um, I mean, first off, you, you got to have a plan. And if it's an instructional video you want to do, it's probably one of the more efficient videos you can make. The video styles you can make is an instructional style video. You got to start with a, a good plan. And that usually means a script or some sort of bullet points. And... You know, it's tough. I, I, I don't know everything about like a proper sort of filming process. So like having a shot list to me is like a whole other thing besides a script. And I think that would take longer to make than it would actually benefit you in the end. Um, when I finish my when I film my instructional videos, I kind of pick two or three different main camera angles and then I'll I'll actually reorganize my script uh, in a completely different order than chronological so that I can film everything from that one camera angle at the same time. So I don't have to get up and move the camera versus, you know, okay, my first paragraphs from this angle, my second paragraphs from that angle. So I just got to keep bouncing back and forth between camera angles. That's, 
that's crazy. That's not efficient at all. So I don't film my videos in order. When I come to the editing process, I usually just kind of have my script handy and I'm able to keep everything pretty quickly chronological in the editing um, process. So yeah, I hope I, did I answer every, all that question? I think I did. I think you did. I think yeah. you did. All right, Scott. Um, now I know you're on Instagram and Facebook. What are your I handles? Yeah, so my my Instagram is at Scotty D Walsh. Um, I have a Facebook page. I'll be honest with you. I started that page just to cash in on some Facebook reels, but I think that program is a little bit uh, watered down now. So I don't know if I'll be using my Facebook page uh, unless there's some money comes back into it. So. All right. Um, Lincoln Street says, I find the shot list too limiting. I think learning what to shoot as you go along is way more important in the long run. All right. Yeah. And uh, Scott, thank you so much for being here. You are always a gentleman. Any uh, closing thoughts for our viewers? Um, closing thoughts. Take it seriously, but have fun while doing it. Um, making videos seems glamorous, but it definitely has a lot of chores involved with it. But in the at the end of the day, you should have a good feeling when you publish a video. All right. And what does Scott say at the end of every one of his videos? He says, bye. Bye. <laughs> and what do I say? I hear my wife calling. I gotta go. You know there ain't another girl like her in the city. No. You know she looks so good, but she ain't so pretty. Don't you let it go If I'm alive and if I'm a ring I'ma let you know You're somewhere in between my legs Hey, you know there ain't another girl Like her in the city Yeah, yeah, you know she looks so good But she ain't so pretty I can't
saw that they were going to have a new market. avatar behind the camera. I do think it helps to imagine that you're actually talking to somebody who will be watching the video. Sometimes it's easy, easy to forget that you see numbers of people watching, but you forget that these are actual 
people watching your video on their phone or on their TV or wherever. And I think it's important to, to keep that in mind.